Um, we work in New York, uh, and we have a very good center there, and uh, our unit is interested in sort of, uh, recurrent UTIs and had very sort of successful many uh, stories with managing recurrent UTIs with different modalities. Uh, the task today, we're going to talk about the bladder scan, residual urine, and relation to urine tract infection. So I'm going to start with a, with a, with a definition about the post-voiding scan. It's a post-voiding residual. It's a volume of urine which remained after you scanned the bladder and which is right away after it rather than leave it in longer. And the UTI, the definition is there. And normally, when you scan the bladder uh, with a, in a healthy, there is no urine left in the, uh, in the bladder. post residual is increased in several conditions, something related to the outlet, bladder outlet, that the bladder is unable to empty. And that could be different causes. For men, BPH, could be stenosis, uh, could be stones. Uh, or could be the other cause is that the bladder itself the f as a function, as a, as a pump, is, is, under, is underactive. And that's why we have a detrusal underactivity. It could be for various reasons. I mean, neurology, neurological cause could be one of them. The other could be aging, could be uh, play a part. Patients could have a bladder diverticulum, and this is like a large volume, sort of a volume or pocket out of the wall of the bladder. And usually this is secondary to an outflow obstruction. Or could be from a reflux as patients happen. But the bladder sort of, sort of residual urine is just, we don't take it by itself. It's a combination with other parameters like the flow or other parameters that we use. Many would ask, what, what is the threshold? What's the cutoff for it? Just going to go with a simple, some several slides and also about some publication about it. And what's the evidence available? What's the cutoff? I mean, is it 100, 150? 70. So still poorly defined. Uh, this is one of the studies by Paul Abraham. Uh, so most urologists use about 50. Some use about 100. Uh, bladder volume is, is measured by with a distended with a bl bladder with a height times the width times the depth times 0.7 as a factor. It is variable, variable through different days, variable on the same person. You remember we're talking about person, we're not talking about patient. I mean, some patient, I've, I've tried it once. We had a, a new bladder scanner. We're trying different. And I scanned my bladder at different times, and it come up as a different number. So they are variable from the day and on even with the same person. It does indicate there's a likelihood of back pressure on the kidneys and maybe predisposed to other things. But may, that's uh, as far as we know from evidence related to you, you see that the large residual urine is related to re urine tract infections, but we're not talking about large in retention. We're talking about slightly higher residual than what you expect. And if you take about the size of the bladder, I mean, a male size bladder between 400 to 500, 400 to 450, a female size bladder between 300 to 350, and it will give you how much a volume cutoff is not equal in both uh, genders. There's one study which many would quote in when you talk about the relation with the residual and the urine susceptibility to urine tract infections. And it's a study by Trusi, and then this is one of, the, one of the main evidence that they found comparing to the rest, which we're going to talk about, which is not as strongly uh, correlated between the two. That in, a in, in men, with asymptomatic men, post voiding 180, is that there's a high risk of bacteriuria. Remember, I didn't say UTI, I just says bacteriuria. However, it says there's a close correlation between that these patients who may develop, they require to introduce a treatment earlier than other patients with a, with a surgery or start medication for their urinary symptoms, for, uh, for presume, although they don't have urinary symptoms now, but this one we require to monitor them. There's another uh, review by Knight about the looked at several studies, sort of residual between 50 to 200, and comparing them uh, with a match the gold standards to catheterize the patients and then to get the exact residual from the rather than the bladder scanner. Although they found the bladder scanner is less invasive with less side effect with less uh, side effect, sensitivity and specificity were sitting around 80 percent. 
and they find that the, the sensitivity will drop if the bladder scan, if the residual is less than 100. Urethrocatheterization is regarded as a goal, the gold standard because this is the one which is, there is no any interference with the, and there's actual reading from the bladder once you put the catheter on empty. However, with the catheterization, we expect there will be a chance of injury and to the, to the patients or, or introducing an infection by itself. And therefore, using an ultrasound scanner is being seen as one of the non-invasive techniques which will give you an idea about the residual volume, although in compromise, although less, less accurate, but in compromise is more acceptable to the patients. So another study they looked at, uh, this is a health technology assessment, the evidence-based analysis about different, uh, about the abuse of bladder scanner. It is found that there's a reduction in the negative health outcome. That's uh, by using the bladder scanner. But this is not related to high volume, high residual would cause UTI. This is by using the bladder scan to detect residual urine and appropriate residual urine that patients you can avoid catheterization and trauma. So catheterization, the second point, was avoided in about 16 to, 40, 16 to, uh, to 47 patients and UTI was reduced accordingly because of reduced catheterization. And then it also noted there was a variability in the type on the model of the bladder scanner, which I'm going to talk about in a minute as well. It's a different type of uh, bladder scanner. Uh, some of you have been on the uh, stations, one of the stations, about, well, about the, one of the bladder scanners, one of the companies. And there's a different, there's a real-time scanner, uh, or there's a one which just give you the actual number. Uh, there's a portable devices, and then something that you can move. There are some devices in which uh, at some point were small enough that you can put them in your pocket. There are some new devices which is just the probe and then the new, uh, you can just connect it to your phone and then an application and then use it in that way. Bladder scanner are easy to use. It's a basic training, although that need to be maintained. Uh, could be carried out in the world. Uh, however, the limitation, remember, it does measure the a cystic structure within the pelvis. So if the patients have a large ovarian cyst, then that will be picked up. If the patients who has, I mean, elderly patients who have ascites, then that will be configured with the image. If a post, uh, postnatal, post, I mean, d delivery, that will be the fluid and the size of the uh, uterus, and then that will be effect affecting it as well, in addition to the bladder diverticulum that we mentioned earlier. The, 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 the other classification used is a, a 3D scanner, 2D scan, and it is, it is a, ba a battery-operated, mostly sort of the portable one, and sort of with the connection to the sort of a head scanner attached to the base. It's one of the nice studies, and whenever any departments want to change their bladder scanner, many com they contact different companies, and they'll come up with their scanners, and then you try to use them. Maybe you find that after that, we can make your mind about what scanner that will be useful to you. One of the nice studies is that Doug Smolin from Glasgow did it. It's compare different kind of scanner, different companies on healthy volunteers. Remember when I mentioned healthy volunteers, that I could be one of them because when I give an example that my bladder, sc I scan myself and I had a different number and I use the same technique. So or even with the same person, on using the same scanner, that could be different. But so we'll but look at it and give you an idea about it. So it's a different scanner. One of them, uh, it's the, the, the eye look, BART scan. I'm sure some of these names that you, you have them in your departments, BVI. Now these are BVI 6,100. Uh, uh, 6, these are maybe slightly older, but still some are in, the, in these departments. And if, you, if you put it at the point as the there's some somewhere better than others, somewhere, I mean, under predicted volume, over predicted volume. But when we're talking about that, this is talking about a volume of 20 to 30. So whether, ma whether that will make a difference in how you manage these patients, I'll doubt it. Uh,
Yeah, there's another study as well, they're comparing about different scanners. You see, mentioning is the different companies there and different types, they're all not a big difference between them. And then that, the, the amount of the difference between is a small. And you also, what you wanted to look at, the contract that you have with the company, the, and then the sort of the repair that they have, the easy of, of use. And mostly, yeah, you, you may be all aware that if you have a bladder scanner in your ward, Another word will, will borrow that, w that scanner that may not come back. You need to have something on a stand and then be familiar with it. So it's a, base, it's a base unit, as mentioned with the screen. This is the one which is, will give you just the number rather than a live scanner. Uh, and it's connected to the, the probe and then you point it on the patients. And the, the, t the, the majority of these, it's been using, using them, they had a basic training in it, and then they can continue to use it. Now, coming to a point which was the main topic about when we said about the relation to post voiding scan and UTI, it mentioned something earlier that large volume post voiding scan is maybe associated with UTI, but this is on a high risk uh, groups that children, neuropath, or diabetic patients. However, there's other group of studies which is of reasonable quality also suggest there is no direct correlation between them. Just going to say some. This is one of the studies they looked at. This is only they looked at UTI and elderly. This, they picked up a nursing home residents, and then they found that there's a patients two thirds of patients who have a less than a hundred residual, uh, comparing to a third which were more than a hundred, and then patients who had a UTI. And then they find that there is no significant difference between the residual volume in relation to UTI. And they says, although the high residual is common, and that's because the fact that we mentioned, because in relation to neuropath, maybe cognitive impairment, bladder emptying, there is no direct correlation between what's the residual urine in that patient or that person, and UTI was found. Another thing which was picked up at you uh, while I'm doing this talk is about the urine bacterial titer. Uh, and they found that there is a relation into the number of bacteria in relation to the volume of the urine. And then the higher titer is associated with a high volume. And the patients who have both high titer and high volume are more predisposed to uh, serious infections and complication with them. And they suggest doing some screening for them. But still, it's not strong evidence for it. And there's another study about UTI in stroke patients. Remember, the first one, we, we, the first UTI in elderly, there's no correlation. Now, this one in stroke patients, they found a correlation between them. And it's that 40% of these patients would have several risk factors to uh, reduce empt bladder emptying and urinary tract infections. And then suggest, which is, you see the point just before last, is that monitoring with the bladder scanner is the most important and simple observation method to prevent UTI. And suggest that patients with a residual of 100 units, then it try intermittent self catheterization One of the points about the, the timing of measuring the bladder scanner, we see some patients in the clinic, normally the patients, they're getting a letter, come with a full bladder. So they come with it by the time they arrive in the clinic, go to the toilet. And if you're a clinic as my clinic, sometimes the patient unfortunately have to wait a bit longer than their actual time. So it will be an hour. So if you imagine the urine output in an adult 70, 70 kilograms is about one mil per hour per, 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 uh, per kilogram. So the patient waits an hour, though, so this is a 70. If the patient's been stable, haven't drank many, haven't drank a lot. So that's the 70 mils would be increased when the patients have the bladder scanner after it. So it's important to time it right away. The, the guidelines available is to measure the bladder scan. It is uh, for patients, all patients with urinary incontinence and measure it for all pediatric patients and some in neuropath. It is not currently, it is something that would be within the guidelines to measure it for urecount UTI. Sometimes you get the bladder scan, doesn't give you the right result. Uh, patients, I mean, you try to pass urine in an unfamiliar environment. You're coming to the 
hospital uh, toilet, maybe you're not able to do it, maybe you're in a rush, uh, pass urine on a command, maybe your bladder is not full. Uh, bladder scanner using sort of uh, a live uh, will give you more adv or real time ad is more advantage than using a simple scanner which is a number although you need to have some technique more training how to use it this is coming to my last slide it just this is so residual urine may be associated with UTI in patients who have an abnormality when it says abnormality, these are the group that we mentioned, the elderly, the diabetic, the neuropath, maybe young patients, but who have a normal urinary system. I mean, if I give you an example, I mean, men over sort of 40 years old, 40, 50 years old, half of them will have post-maturation dribbling. Benign prosthetic hyperplasia will start in men when they're 30 years old. 60% 60 60 of men over 60 will have urinary lower tract symptoms in range between mild to moderate and severe. Half of the ladies around over 50 years old would have urinary incontinence of some sort. So I know that the, the statement, so we, we may have in one way or another an abnormal urinary system, but that doesn't manifest in a big picture. Thank you.